In this video, we're going to talk about how to compute the Fibonacci sequence in C, both iteratively and recursively. So the Fibonacci sequence is the sequence of numbers created by the sum of the two previous numbers. And you have to start somewhere, so you start with 0 and 1. And the Fibonacci sequence comes up actually in all kinds of places. It's kind of a cool mathematical concept. And if you look at the sequence that we've got here, the first number is 0, the next number is 1. We would compute the next number in the sequence by adding these two together, and we would get 1. Then to compute the next number in the sequence, we would add the last two numbers together, which are now 1 and 1, and we would get 2. And then to compute the next number in the sequence, we would add the previous two numbers together, which are now 2 and 1. We would get 3. And then we add together 3 and 2 to get 5. And it just keeps going. So you add together you know, 3 and 5 to get 8, and then you know, 8 and 5 to get 13, and it just keeps on going, 21 and beyond. And that's the Fibonacci sequence. Now we can compute this reasonably easily with C. So let's go over a program that'll do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it both iteratively and recursively, which are two different approaches. The iterative approach is going to be based on using a loop to compute the, the next number in the sequence. The recursive approach is going to be based on having a function that calls itself. And so let's do the iterative approach first. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two variables that store the previous numbers. So I'm going to say term one is going to be zero and term two is going to be one because those are the first two numbers in the sequence. And then I'm going to store the next number in the sequence with this variable here, fib n. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the user for the length of the sequence to compute. So I'll say like int length and I'll initialize it to zero, but I'm going to ask the user for the length of the sequence to compute. And we'll just say like print f enter sequence length so enter sequence length, and then we'll do a scan f, and we'll store what they give us into length. And what I'm going to say is that the length has to be at least three. If it's not at least three, then it's not really interesting. So we're just going to say, if the length is less than three, tell the user like, hey, it's got to be larger than three. So we'll just say length must be greater than equal to three. And we're going to keep asking them. So I've got a do while loop here. So we're going to keep asking them for the length until they pick a length that is greater than or equal to three. Okay, so now that we've got the length of the sequence that we want to compute, let's actually output the sequence itself. And we're going to do it iteratively first, which means we're going to have a loop that's going to each time compute the next number in the Fibonacci sequence. So I'm going to actually call it the, the iterative solution. I'm going to say print F and I'm going to say iterative solution. And what I'm going to do is the first two numbers in the sequence we already have. I already have term one and term two. So because I already have the first two numbers in the sequence, I'm just going to print them out. I'm going to say percent %d, comma, percent %d, comma, and we'll just print them out. We'll say term one, term two, just output them. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a loop to compute the next terms in the sequence. So I'm going to say, okay, starting with i being two, because we're on like, we're on the third number in the sequence. So counting from zero, zero, one, two, we want the third number in the sequence beyond. We're going to say starting from two, going until i is less than length, i plus plus. What we're going to do is we're going to compute the next term in the sequence and print it out. So we're going to say fib n, the next term in the sequence, is equal to the last two terms in the sequence. So fib n is equal to term one plus term two, which are the last two terms in the sequence. And then we're going to print out the new number. So we're going to say the new number is percent %d, and we'll print it out. We'll print out fib n. Then what we want to do is the next time through the loop, the last two numbers will have updated, right? It's like the first time through the loop, it's like we're, we're basically saying like compute this next term here by adding these last two terms together. But the next time through the loop, the last, the last two terms are not going to be these ones the last two terms are going to be these two numbers and then these two numbers and then these two numbers and then these two numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to update term one and term two. We're going to update what the last two numbers are. So now what we're going to say is we're going to say that term one is equal to term two and we're going to say that term two is equal to fib n. And what we're doing is we're shifting the numbers now. We're basically saying like, okay, this was term one before, now make this term one. And this is now term two, the new number that we, commu the new number that we computed there. 
So it's just going to shift, you know, what are, what are the last two terms according to what we just computed there. And then what we can do is, what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to print out my numbers in a nicely formatted way. I want there to be a comma after each number except for the last number. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say if i doesn't equal the length minus one. So if we haven't reached the end of the sequence that we want to compute, print out a comma. So if we're not at the end of the sequence that, we've, that we're computing, print out a comma because we're going to have another number after it. Otherwise, if we are at the end of the sequence, we've printed out all the numbers we want to print out from that sequence, print a new line to say that we're done. Now this should be enough to actually compute the sequence. So let's, let's give it a try here. We're going to say GCC dash out demo dot C and then we'll run it here. So it's enter sequence length. So if I, if I try to put in like one, it'll say like length must be greater than or equal to three. So we've got some like error checking there. Now, if I say like six here, I get iterative solution zero, one, one, two, three, five. And that's making sense. If I say like 10, I get zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34. So it looks like it's working. And this is an iterative solution. So what we've got here is we've got a loop that each time is computing the Fibonacci number, the next Fibonacci number in the sequence based on the previous two terms in the sequence. And that's one way that we could solve this problem. What's kind of nice about this solution is that we're very much, we're, we're using the, the old values that we computed previously in the computation of our new solution. The only thing about this solution may be that it's not really like a bad thing really necessarily because it's nice and efficient to do it this way. But one of the ways you can represent a Fibonacci number is with something like this. You could say that like, the Fibonacci number n is equal to the Fibonacci number of n minus one plus the Fibonacci of Fibonacci number of n minus two, where f zero is equal to zero and f one is equal to one. And the idea here is that we're expressing that the first two numbers in the sequence are zero and one. And to compute any future number in the sequence n, we're just going to add together the value of the Fibonacci of Fibonacci number of n minus one plus the Fibonacci number of n minus two, where n is the number in the sequence. So if I want to compute like, you know, the Fibonacci number of, you know, two here, like the next number in the sequence, then this would be n minus one, which is one, we'd get one plus, and then n minus two would be zero, and we get zero, which would be equal to one. And the idea is that with this sort of more mathematical expression of the sequence, we're kind of expressing it at, at that level of kind of a, a more mathematical description of, of how to compute the Fibonacci sequence. The only thing with our code here, I mean, it, it's, it's very efficient and it's nice. The only thing with our code here is that it's less, it's maybe a little bit less clear that we're compu computing the Fibonacci sequence. So there is another way that we could go about computing it and it's called recursion. So we could use recursion and recursion is when you have a function that calls itself. So we have a function that calls itself. And the idea here is that when we go to compute the Fibonacci number of n, like when we, when we want the nth Fibonacci number, like the nth number in the sequence, we can get it by actually having the function call itself to compute the previous Fibonacci numbers. And the function will call itself to compute the previous Fibonacci numbers. And eventually what will happen is the function will keep calling itself to compute previous Fibonacci numbers. And eventually what happens is we get down to these, what are called base cases, where we're going to actually return specific values there. And so we could technically then express our solution to the problem in a format that matches the math a little bit more. So let's give that a shot. We could say here, print F and we'll say slash N, we'll say recursive solution. And we're gonna say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than length, i plus plus, we want to compute the Fibonacci number. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a function now that's going to compute that Fibonacci number, and it's going to call itself to compute the Fibonacci number. So I'm going to call it int fib, and we'll say int n. And what n is, is n is starting from zero, counting from zero, the number in the sequence. So this would be like the zeroth number, this would be the first number, second number, third number, fourth number, fifth number, 
six number in the sequence because we're going to count from zero because that's what we do as computing uh, professionals. So we're going to count from zero and we're going to say that we're going to make this function that's going to recursively compute the Fibonacci number. So let's go down here and let's set it up. So the way it works, this is the this is kind of the nice thing about it is that it's going to match very much the mathematical description of how to compute a Fibonacci number. So we're going to say here, if n is greater than one, so if n is greater than one, we're going to return fib of n minus one plus fib of n minus two. So what we're saying here, this is this is what's called the recursive step. What we're saying here is that if we're trying to compute the Fibonacci number for n greater than one, so in other words, two, three, four, and beyond, then what we want to do is we want to return the Fibonacci number for the previous number in the sequence and the second previous number in the sequence, the last two numbers in the sequence. And we're actually going to use this function to compute those numbers because it can. It's going to be able to. Now, eventually what's going to happen though is that, you know, if initially like n is seven, right? If initially n is seven, well then Fibonacci is going to be called with six and with five, right? And then when it's called with six, it's going to be called with, you know, five and four. And when it's called with four, it's going to be called with three and two. And when it's called with two, it's going to be called with two and one. And then one and zero, right? And eventually the function can't just keep calling itself. Eventually it has to return values. And that's where the base steps come in. That's where the base cases come in. And these are the values that are actually going to, this is, these are the uh, values of n for which the function is going to actually return a value and not just call itself. So the base cases are if n is one, return one. Else if n is zero, we're going to return zero. If somehow this function is ever called with a number that is less than zero, that's not going to make any sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to print F an error. We're going to say print F. We're going to say error n must be greater than equal to zero. And we're going to say return negative one. So we're going to say return negative one. Now, this is just like one way of handling this error case. It doesn't really have to be this way. You could just assume that they're always going to pass in, you know, a valid value here. But we're just going to decide to handle the error like this. And, and that's fine. Like you don't, you don't have to do it this way, but this is one way we could do it. So let's, let's try this function now. So what we're going to do now here is, is in our loop here, we're going to go from zero to length and we're going to print out each number in the sequence. And we're going to do it by calling this function. So we're going to say here, print F and we're going to say percent D fib I. Then we're going to say if I, and we're going to do the same thing we did here. We're basically going to, we can actually copy this code here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to check if we're done computing the sequence, like if we're on the last value, we want to print out a new line. Otherwise, if we're not on the last value yet, like if we haven't reached the last value yet in our sequence, print out a comma because we want to put commas in between the values in our sequence. And that's just the little trick I'm using here. You don't have to do that. It could be a space here. It doesn't really matter, but that's a trick I'm doing there. And so this will also compute the Fibonacci sequence. So we can run this here and it'll say enter sequence length. And I'll put in like, let's say five. And you see that I get the same answers for iterative and recursive solution. I could put in 10, I get the same answers. I could put in 20, I get the same answers there. And so they're, they're computing the, the same sequence. They're just doing it in different ways. Now, the only thing with the, the, the Fibonacci, the recursive Fibonacci computation, the only thing with this solution is that if you look at it, what's going on here is that when we give this like some number in our sequence, like 10, there's going to be a lot of function calls resulting from that. Because if you give the number 10 here, what happens is the function calls itself twice with nine and eight, the two previous numbers in the sequence, right? So it's going to call itself twice. Now for each of those two times, the function is called, you don't have that n is one or n is zero yet, right? Because you've got nine and eight. So what's going to happen is the, 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 the time that the function is called with nine, it's going to be called again with eight and seven. And when it was called with eight, it's going to be called again with seven and six and on and on. And so what happens is the function in terms of the amount of times it's going to be called, it explodes as the number n goes up. It's going to explode. It's going to just, in terms of the, the sort of a number of times it needs to be called, it's just going to uh, greatly increase. And so what we can do here is 
for this recursive solution, let's try it with a very large number. Let's try it with like, I'm going to say clear here just to get it up on top. This time let's call it with a large number, like let's say 45. So if I call it 45, the iterative solution is done, but the recursive solution is still working. It's still having to do the computations. And it's because the, the number of times that the Fibonacci function needs to be called just keeps on getting higher and higher the, the larger the number is, and it keeps getting slower and slower. And so while the recursive solution might kind of fit the, the mathematical definition of the Fibonacci sequence a little bit better in the sense that you can very clearly see the algorithm here. At the same time, computationally, it's less efficient. And so that is something that we should be aware of if we're going to try to solve this problem. Check out PortfolioCourses.com, where we'll help you build a portfolio that will impress employers, including courses to help you develop C programming projects.